and welcome to Exploring with the Estuarium. My name is Ariel and I'll be your educator. Today we're going to learn how the shorelines of the Puget Sound and Bud Inlet have changed over time and what that might mean to the health of the Sound and those of us who live here. In part one of Oysters and Estuaries, we will learn about the Native American tribes who have inhabited the area since time immemorial, the European settlers who immigrated to Olympia, and the first changes to the shoreline. The Salish Sea was originally named Wolds, an angelicization for the Lushootsi name, meaning sea, saltwater, ocean, or sound. In 1792, George Vancouver named the waters south of the Tacoma Narrows Puget Sound, in honor of Peter Puget, a Huguenot lieutenant on his Vancouver expedition. The United States Geological Survey defines a sound as a bay, or more specifically, a fjord system of flooded glaciers. The Puget Sound is the largest estuary by volume of water, and the second largest by area. Puget Sound's main basin was altered by the last ice age and the retreating of the Vashon glaciation, eroding the landscape from melting water and leaving glacier till deposits that are less than 10,000 years old. At the most southern end of the Puget Sound is Olympia, that sits on Bud Inlet, Bud Inlet was named by Charles Wilkes during the United States Exploring Expedition in honor of Thomas Bud, acting master of the Peacock and Vincennes. Bud Inlet is approximately 7 miles long and about 1.5 miles wide, with an average depth of 9 meters at low tide and 354 meters near the mouth. Deschutes River is the major source of fresh water flowing into the bay. Historically, Bud Inlet had many pocket estuaries, or small estuaries inside a larger estuary. These pocket estuaries were fed by Percival, Indian, and Moxley Creek. Bud Inlet is the southernmost arm of the Puget Sound. The peninsula known as Olympia was Staychaz to the coastal Salish who occupied the site for many generations before the American settlement was established. Historically, the shores were home to the Staychaz people a sub-tribe of the Nisqually Indians. The Staychaz had a permanent village at the base of Tumwater Falls for thousands of years before the coming of white settlers. The end of what we know as Bud Inlet was a favorite shellfish gathering site for many coastal Salish tribes, including the Nisqually, Duwamish, and Squaxin. Potlatches, the Northwest tribal custom in which tribal leaders shared their wealth with neighboring tribal groups, were held both east and west of the inlet near Olympia. Staychaz, both place and people, continue to inhabit the beaches of Bud Inlet after the Euro-Americans settled into Olympia. Early trade was with the Native Americans who occupied Chinook Street in Olympia in their longhouses located near Columbia Street and 4th Avenue. Near the site stood the historical Squaxin village of Shiktwu. For millennia, a staple food for the Squaxin was the Olympia oyster. After the arrival of American settlers, Olympia oysters became an important trade item. The first American settlers to the Olympia area were Levi Lathrop Smith and Edmund Sylvester, who claimed the town site in 1846, naming it Smither, or Smithers, and later Smithfield, after themselves. The town was officially plated in 1850 by Sylvester, at which point it was given the name Olympia, as suggested by Isaac N. Edby, a local resident, in recognition of the view of the majestic Olympic mountains seen to the north on a clear day. Sylvester, a Maine native, laid out the town in a New England style with a town square, tree-lined streets, land for schools, a Masonic temple, and capital grounds. Drawn to the small peninsula as the first access to Puget Sound from the Columbia River on the Cowlitz Trail, American settlers numbered close to a thousand in the area by 1853. In the early 1850s, as the settler population grew, businesses developed such as stores, brickyards, boat builders, dry docks, hotels, and services for summer visitors. The area was heavily forested to the water's edge, and travel by land was not easy. The population was supported by steamboats collectively called the Mosquito Fleet that used the sound as a watery highway to move mail, products, and passengers. In the mid-1850s, Olympia developed around the waterfront and quickly became a hub of maritime commerce. Federal officers and those seeking the opportunities of the capital flocked to the city, 
which at one time boasted the largest population of any town on the Puget Sound. After European settlers arrived, the desire for a deep water port led to a series of projects beginning in the 1880s to dredge shipping channels and use the spoils to create land north of what is now known as State Avenue. The front of the estuarium was the original northern extent of dry land in Olympia. Beyond and surrounding this point was a tide flat that stretched nearly one mile northward during low tide. It was a productive shellfish gathering site for native people for thousands of years. To the east of the estuary on Cherry Street was a creek. This creek, named Moxley Creek, created a slough and flowed into the sound. The long marshy slough ran all the way to where McDonald's is now located. Blue heron, red-winged blackbirds, ducks, and salmon occupied the creek. The first bridge in Olympia was built over this creek in 1855 because the people working at the capital had settled on the Upper East Side of Olympia and got tired of taking their rowboats to get to Olympia. The early wooden bridge fell down when a herd of 24 cows went over it, so a new one was built. After the initial dredge of Bud Inlet, there was a second dredging project in 1911. The mud from the bay was used to fill in the slough, destroying the marsh and estuary habitat. In Puget Sound, more than 50% of wetlands, like the one that used to be there, have been filled in. At low tide, one can see Moxley Creek flowing into the bay. When the slough was filled in, the creek was put into a pipe that flows under the roads and empties into the bay. The creek enters the pipe around I-5. Before it enters the pipe, the creek flows through neighborhoods where it can pick up chemicals used by people, such as fertilizers or soap from washing their cars. If you look out over the waters of East Bay, where Moxley Creek joins Bunt Inlet, there are pilings where once stood a mill that turned logs into paper products. The way they got the logs to the mill is by floating in a log boom that was pulled by a tugboat and then the logs were left there at the pilings tied up. When the mill needed them, they were pulled out of the water up a ramp into the mill. The old pilings are of historical interest, but they were treated with chemicals so that they would not rot, and those chemicals leak out into the sound and contribute to pollution. One animal that lost its habitat when all the marshes were filled in was the marten, which likes to nest in the marshes. So in the last few years, a program was started to install marten nest boxes to give them a place to raise their babies. Now there are many nests and the martens raise their babies in them each year. Most of East Bay Park used to be a sawmill until the second half of the last century, when it was left to a wasteland with polluted soil from all the chemicals used by the mill. Then in the early 2000s, the Port of Olympia, who owns the land, cleaned out the polluted soil and chemicals and built the East Bay Park, as well as the Hands-On Children's Museum and Lot Building located across the street. East Bay Park celebrates water with a replica stream that shows the wildlife that uses clean streams and how the streams have seeps and artisan springs. At the Wet Science Center is a man-made wetland that resembles what the land used to be. The plants in the wetland include bulrushes, horsetail, lily pads, and arrow plants. The animals include real red-winged blackbirds and frogs. The water used is reclaimed water, something very important to protecting Puget Sound. Normally, sewer water from your sink, shower, toilet, and storm drains comes to the sewage treatment plant and is cleaned and then released into Bud Inlet. The reclaimed water is cleaned more than needed to be released into the sound so it can be used to water the plants or to run fountains. Reclaimed water is what is being used at the Wet Science Center and in the East Bay Plaza and anywhere you see a purple pipe. The sewage water treatment plant is very important because it takes the germs and pollutants out of the sewer water and makes it clean enough to release into the Puget Sound. Until about 1955, the mudflats that were exposed at low tide were the city garbage dump and people let all their waste go right into the ocean thinking that it didn't matter, but it did. It killed out much of the rich wildlife that used to live in Bud Inlet, and that which remains is now considered contaminated. The opening to Bud Inlet is very small, so it takes a long time for garbage and pollutants to be washed out to sea.